So far, DICE has revealed six of the 11 unique weapons coming to the In the Name of the Tsar DLC. The Double Barrel Shotgun for the Assault Class, the Fedorov Avtomat for the Medic, the MG-14 Parabellum for the Support, the Mosin Nagant for the Scout, and the Nagant Revolver as an all-kit pistol. Now that leaves five completely unaccounted for at the moment, and I have a feeling that DICE might pull a Battlefield Hardline here and add the five remaining weapons as access to all, meaning they come with the DLC update, but they aren't tied to the DLC and any player can use them. That would be a really nice gesture for players considering we've now been playing with the base game weapons for almost 10 months and some new additions to freshen things up would go down well with the community. But what could those five remaining weapons actually be? Well, I've worked with my friend Toby Wood, you might have heard me mention him here before, and we've put together a list that we think could fit well into Battlefield 1 as it stands right now. These aren't Russian-themed weapons because we're assuming that DICE is going to add them for free, but that isn't confirmed yet. That's just my suspicion. We felt these are ones that will add to the experience or they will simply fill a gap in the game. Most of these weapons we've mentioned before, but the scope of weapons available to add to Battlefield 1 is getting smaller and smaller now. Okay then, let's get things started. Weapon number one sits in the Assault class. It's the MGOA SMG prototype. Now, only one of these weapons is known to exist, and at face value, it's essentially a shrunk down MGOA heavy machine gun using more appropriate ammunition. This picture here of the weapon is from Tula State University in Russia, and presumably the weapon was designed by Germans. And that was in an attempt to try and build a weapon that was suited to quicker attacks and trench warfare. They eventually made the MP-18 submachine gun. It's interesting how it fell into Russian hands, however. They must have been fighting on the Eastern Front. The weapon was fed by a box magazine filled with eight clips of 10 9mm parabellum rounds. So not your typical box magazine. Rounds were pulled up into the chamber, and once the tenth round of a clip had been fired, the whole clip would slide to the right, allowing the next one to be used. A similar air cooling method was used as on the original MG-08 machine gun, but no one knows if this thing ever saw any combat during World War I, or even who made it. We assume it was made by Germany, but there is no documentation of its development at all. So another nation could have captured an MG-08 and tried to make one that was a little bit smaller. This would fit nicely into the assault class in Battlefield 1 and might offer a slower firing, higher damage option to some of the other SMGs and carbines that are already available. Weapon number two is the Farquhar Hill Rifle, a British weapon which was on the cusp of deployment and would have been in British soldiers' hands in 1919 had the war not ended in late 1918 and the Central Powers surrendered. This was a fully automatic rifle using the then standard British 303 cartridge and that was in good supply due to its use in the Lee Enfield bolt action rifle. Various magazine sizes existed, but the two offered by the manufacturer were 20 or 65 round capacities, and that gave it significant sustained power and would have been put to good use suppressing enemies from your own trench line. It found success during trials up in the skies, with aerial spotters in planes where having an automatic weapon was seen as a huge advantage over a bolt action, far less fiddling about. Its use there, however, was effectively cancelled when empires and armies realised they could just mount machine guns to planes instead. Now, roughly 100,000 Farquhar Hill rifles were ordered by the British War Office in 1918, but as I mentioned, before production even started, the war ended. Now, considering the Russian DLC weapon coming to the Medic is also fully automatic, the Fedorov Avtomat, having another one seems like a good fit. Like London buses, you stand waiting forever for one to arrive, and then two come along at once. That could be the case with the Farquhar Hill and the Fedorov. Weapon number three falls into the support class, and it's probably one of the crazier looking weapons that I've come across. This is the American-designed 1917 Burton LMR, standing for Light Machine Rifle. 
Designed by Winchester in 1917, the weapon featured a standout dual magazine design, and this was partly due to one of its two intended roles, aircraft mounting. The Burton fired a brand new cartridge, developed by Winchester as well, the 345 WSL. It was an incendiary spitz around, and it was intended for piercing and blowing up enemy observation balloons. It would then be mounted to planes using a scarf mount so the user had a nice wide angle to shoot from and would fire those rounds strafing at balloons in the sky. However, its second use option was to put it in the hands of infantry on the ground. It had been developed with a shoulder stock and a recoil system that would push the force into the holder's shoulder and that was to stop muzzle climb significantly during operation. There was of course the slight issue with vision, two large protruding magazines sticking out the top of the barrel, each filled with 20 rounds. This didn't make operation ideal, but up in the plane, switching over two empty magazines was far easier than feeding in single rounds via a receiver. On the ground and in the air, once a magazine had emptied, the user would need to pull back the bolt into a second locking position so they could start firing from the second magazine. Translating that into infantry use in Battlefield 1 could be a little bit tricky. Fire 20 of your total 40 rounds, a quick bolt pull animation, and then the second magazine gets used. I do, however, think it fits into the support role quite nicely, a large magazine size to offer the class something vastly different in operation than what we have right now. Weapon number four is the Carcano rifle, and I've made the case for this weapon to be added several times already. The rifle is of Italian origin and was their standard issue rifle throughout World War I. Considering we have the Italians in the game, I think it's a shame they don't already have their own rifle to use, so this DLC presents a great opportunity for DICE to fill that gap. Having said that, I can see why DICE perhaps chose to omit it because its operation is very similar to the already included Austro-Hungarian Gewehr M95. Both of them use on-block clips for loading ammunition, and they both have a fairly fast fire rate. However, that's not going to stop me campaigning for it to be added to the game anyway. Some other standard issue rifles that wouldn't go amiss are a true 1903 infantry variant for the Americans, and the Ottoman Mauser, similar to the Gewehr 98. And lastly, weapon number five to round out the list, we have the Webley Automatic Pistol, or as it's sometimes known, the self-loading pistol. This was the weapon developed by Webley during a similar time to when Hugh Fairfax was making his iconic, but ultimately failed, Mars Automatic Pistol. Both of these weapons were vying for a contract from the British War Office to become the next standard issue pistol, and Webley's attempt had its own issues. If you thought the Mars Automatic had issues, well, this one had some too. The cartridge material left the barrel covered in residue, and it wasn't until two years later after its adoption by the Royal Navy that Webley actually solved that issue and then produced the Mark 1Z. This weapon stayed in service until the 1940s, interestingly, despite some issues with the grip being fairly badly designed. This, I think, would make a neat addition as an all-class pistol for Battlefield 1. It features a seven-round magazine with plenty of power behind it, and maybe you could even see it as a competitor to the M1911. There's no doubt that that thing is definitely the fan-favorite pistol right now. So those are our suggestions for the five remaining weapons coming to the Russian DLC in the name of the Tsar. I think they'll be separate and they'll come to all players and then those six Russian weapons will be locked into the DLC and only available if you buy the DLC. And that's not to mention the other melee weapons that DICE still haven't revealed yet either. They aren't being counted in the same number as the primary and the secondary weapons. So there's still lots to be revealed. Let me know what you think of these suggestions and any other options you might have down below in the comments section. I'd be interested to know what your suggestions are because as I said at the start of the video, our options for these weapons is getting smaller and smaller every time DICE release a new set. I'll be down there reading as many comments as I can. But until next time, my name is Westy and I'll catch you guys in the next video.